to be honest, I, I never, I had never heard of UDC, even though I had run two HBCUs before. Uh, but then Dr. Kreider came down to Baton Rouge and, and we had dinner and she talked to me. And uh, the more I looked, the more I realized that uh, it was a bed of potential that had not been tapped. And I had been in the industry long enough and made all my mistakes and it seemed like it was a good place to go and try to put to bear everything that I had learned over the course of the past 20 something years uh, to an institution that looked like it had a high level of potential. Institution, if you, if you look at it, is really less than 50 years old. And in the first 40 years, it had had something like 22 presidents and interim presidents. And so that was a challenge, the lack of stability, uh, the perception that UDC was a second choice school, uh, the issue about the district or the federal government really having a scholarship program that actually pays students to leave. DC and go to school at other public institutions besides UDC. Audits were, were a challenge. We had uh, our servers, our technology was really outdated and sitting in a hot room in a building uh, that we've since condemned on campus. It was a long list, um, but I think the biggest challenge was that uh, nobody really believed in UDC, at least not from my perception at the time. I read consulting reports where the business community said uh, they didn't want to give any money to UDC. Uh, the faculty and staff here seemed uh, you know, demoralized to some extent. And so um, there was a lot, a lot going on. But again, if you focused on the potential, you could see that uh, everything was fixable as long as you knew the possibilities were there. So we started selling the possibilities. I think what's been most surprising is that the district and the constituencies of the district didn't really understand what a jewel they have here. I mean, to be the only public institution of higher learning in the nation's capital, that's also a specially designated by Congress HBCU, and also the only exclusively urban land grant university in the nation when most of the country is going to be urban and most of the world is going to be urban in the very near future, uh, in, a, in a jurisdiction that actually has money. Um, these are rare uh, components of an institution that if you really focus on the possibilities can, can grow and develop over time. And so what really uh, surprised me was that uh, even though the district uh, was starting to see itself as a, a modern urban center, uh, had brought back the, the par park systems and the uh, recreation systems and the new buildings for the public K-12 public schools. And even the library is a world class. The most important thing, the hub of it all, is your university. And that was the last thing on the list. The more I came to understand the university and the institution, the fact that it's the entire system of higher education for the district, public system of higher education. The more I realized that um, the, the unit that we call the community college, which is really not a community college because it's not separately accredited and it doesn't offer its own degrees, uh, but that's where most of the students from the public school system enter our doors. But I had never worked at a community college before, so I saw things from the perspective of a four-year school and so when we built out the student support systems, which we did from scratch, uh, and a lot of the work that we did in terms of uh, you know, strengthening the faculty, uh, we really were focused more on the Van Ness campus and the community college. Mm -hmm. If I had to do over again, I would have reversed it. Uh, I think that the community college, or what we call our community college, is actually uh, the key to the future of the institution. Uh, the key to enrollment, the key to the local market, and the key to the work that we have to do to be um, a model for urban student success. And so if I had one thing to do over again, I would have put more emphasis there uh, as opposed to on the Van Ness campus. You know, I'm still going to be working at UDC and I'll play whatever role the next leader 
and leadership wants me to, but I think I'd be a pretty good advisor uh, on the quiet side of the fence. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say I'll be available. And, you know, even though I'm not state of the art anymore, you know, I still have some art in me and some knowledge in me. And I think it will be helpful to the next person. What am I most proud of? I'd say uh, two things, two or three. One, I really do believe that um, the district is starting to see UDC as a university. That's the first piece, right? Because I don't know that that was true eight years ago. Uh, some people saw it as a community college. Some people wanted it to be a community college, right? But it is, it is a, a bona fide institution of higher education and it's an entire system. And I think people are starting to see and understand that. That's the first piece. The second piece is that they're starting to see it as a first choice university. And I would use uh, the Dawn initiative that we put into place where we give every public high school graduate, charter in DC public schools, with a 3.0 or above a scholarship to come here. Mm -hmm. And when we started, we, we had maybe 20. Uh, now we have over 250. And so that's a good indication that we're starting to see PC more as, as a first choice. And I think the third piece is the graduation rate. You know, the bachelor's rate was 15% when we got here. Now it's like 45%. Uh, and the overall rate was uh, 13%. And now it's about 25%, which is, is pretty good if you're at open enrollment institutions, which is which we are, because they combine the two-year, the three-year rate with the six-year rate. And when you put them together, the 45 and the 13 ends up being something like 25. So those three things I'd say. Plus, I, well, one more thing. I would say finally getting uh, the funds we need to renovate the campus and have the type of facilities that, uh, higher education facilities that students in the district deserve. So when we put together the equity imperative, I remember uh, a, a few things. One, we were early in the in the game of getting the attention of uh, early in the game of getting the attention of the powers that be, the administration, uh, to put funding into UDC. So we actually started doing like these political campaigns at the uh, at the uh, budget hearings, at T-shirts, and the students were rallying and things like that. And so that was pretty cool. But, um, but the equity imperative was part of that process. So, you know, we talked, it was really broad based. We talked to ANC members, we had town hall meetings, we talked to students, faculty, staff. After much debate, it ended up being a, a really solid plan. You know, and a vision that all of our students would reach their highest levels of human potential, knowing that potential can change over time, you know, made perfect sense for an institution like us. And to be a model of urban student success, you know, made perfect sense for us since we are a model urban institution. And the fact that we're a system and able to connect uh, the, the, the pathways from workforce to associate's degrees to bachelor's degrees and make them seamless with multiple credentials and multiple on and off ramps. And now with the Dawn Initiative, actually pushing it down to the high schools and the middle schools. Uh, you know, it's a vision, I think, for the future, not only of the institution, but for higher education in general. Uh, and we stuck to the plan. And, uh, you know, despite uh, delaying, we didn't have a, a chief academic officer for the first year and a half. And so I had to act like a chief academic officer. I'd give myself a, a C plus, maybe a B if on a good day. Um, and we also had to go through COVID. Uh, and so in spite of all of that, I think we made really good progress, even to the point where you know, the board took the position, look, we don't want to redo a strategic plan. We want to take the equity imperative and update it because we like the track we're on. Just want to make sure that it's updated and that we stay on that track. Well, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. What I told the mayor when I, when I kind of gave her a status report, you know, UDC is healthy now, but it's not quite ready to run a marathon. And so when I talk about, you know, the vision of, of a great institution of higher education, and in a minute I'll tell you about George Washington and how he plays into all that, right? That's probably another five, six, seven years down the road. 
if we stay on track, right? Uh, the facilities, you know, still have to come online. You know, we've just started a new library. We're about to renovate the Van Ness campus. We're going to redo the, the Bacchus campus. We're going to redo the old Congress Heights campus. You know, now we have the footprint, but we need to have the, the environments conducive to learning. That still needs to be done. I think that the building out of the seamless pathways, you know, connecting the, the pipeline still needs to be done. Uh, we've gotten some done, maybe 60%, another 40%. Uh, the work we're doing in Ward 8 in Anacostia, the, the developing America's workforce nucleus dawn, I think is a perfect uh, testing ground for different ways to rethink public education once you accept the fact that uh, America is basically a rigged competition. And in a rigged competition, you have to suppress the talent of the people you don't want to compete. And if you look at the structural uh, kind of dysfunction of public education in poor communities, black communities, brown communities, from that perspective, then you start to rethink how do you identify potential in ways that, you know, not like standardized tests that correlate to race and social status. How do you train teachers to teach students in low income quartiles? How do you build out the pipeline so that they start before the child is even born and are continuous and supportive all the way up through to a, a bachelor's degree. Those are the things we're trying to test out and figure out in the Anacostia Partnership, Dawn. Uh, but if we, learn, if we figure it out, we're going to be able to apply it institution-wide at the university, which would really make UDC uh, you know, cutting edge in terms of the future of the nation, not just higher education in general. I'll tell you this, what, what, what I'm hoping to do in retirement, right? Well, two things. One, so, you know, I'm tenured at the law school and uh, Edgar Kahn, the founder of the law school, which used to be Antioch Law School, I taught a course called Systems Change. I think I'd like to take that course and massage it a bit and teach a course on systems change, but the system of light I'd like to change is the system of white supremacy in America. And what I'd like to do is connect it to the work in Ward 8 because the components of that system and how it's impacting that community and the people in that community, right? And so I haven't quite figured it all out yet, but, um, you know, that's America's great challenge, right? This, 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 this system that concentrate wealth in the hands of very few people and, and keep people's mind off of the fact that most of the wealth is in a very small portion of the population and then that oppresses people of color. And so as long as America is committed to that business model, the, our companies will always be complaining about not being able to find talent, right? Because we've created a system that suppresses more talent than it produces. So having said that, so it's, it's that systems change course and connecting it to the real world that I'm kind of excited about. I don't know that I'll have a legacy in the sense that in a sense of something history will remember, right? Because even though I'm the longest serving president, you know, given the path that the university's on, I think most of the work we did here um, will be part of the next, the legacy of whoever reaps the benefit of it, right? Because it still is a work in progress. And the work that we did, I know you gave a long list of accomplishments, but I think those are gonna pale compared to uh, the, the, the story that's ultimately going to be written about UDC, right? And so, and I don't, I'm not focusing on a whole lot of legacy stuff. I got a whole office full of awards and, you know, trophies and I don't even know what to do with them because I got a two bedroom condo and there's no room there for any of it, right? But, you know, if UDC, if UDC ends up becoming the kind of institution that I think it can become and will become, I think I'll be a, a footnote in history, you know, who passed through uh, at, the, at, the, at a time to do a very specific job, which I, I hope I've done. I think steady the course, steady on the course, you know. Um, 
you know, we are uh, getting to be known now. You know, remember uh, eight years ago, I had never heard of UDC, right? But now we're the 17th best HBCU in the country, right? So in other rankings, I don't put much in the rankings, but people notice those things. So we're getting to be known. Uh, we're attracting a really high quality faculty. Um, and now I think with this next uh, union agreement, you know, we're going to have pretty competitive salaries, right? Because our issue wasn't attracting them, it was keeping them. I think these uh, facilities are going to be very nice uh, over the course of the next five years. I think you're going to see uh, an emerging HBCU land-grant university in the nation's capital that over the next five years will have emerged. You know, it won't be a secret anymore. And, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be here available to federal agencies. You know, people will call on us to talk about the student success systems we put in place that turned us into a model of urban student success. I'm hoping the next president will uh, embrace what's happening over in Ward 8, right? Because that's more than just the university. It really is, you know, what's happening in the district and gentrification and, you know, the traditional residents of the district and how they gonna, how they fit into the future of the district. And UDC is in the middle of all of that, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, my hope is that UDC is, a, is, a, is, a, is an institution that makes residents proud to say it's their university in the nation's capital.